Um, so one of our volunteers is a bit of a whiz kid with this kind of thing, and he's put this together for us. It's not a signalling system. <coughs> I would stress that it's so we can see what's going on. We can see all the track circuits and level crossings, etc. They're not active at the moment because we've only got the first bit of it active, which is Romney Sands. Um, but we're working our way through putting it together. So this is the first bit that's gone active. We were going to um, have basically stainless steel panel like that with LEDs poked through it um, and the circuit boards behind, which is what you'll see at Romney Sands on the little text. Um, panel that's there and then we found out you can buy a TV like that for 300 quid <laughs> which is actually the cheap option we can mm. chop and change it around and do what we like with it very easily so in the middle of the two illustrations of a dive rock machine you can see a flashing red light that means the case is open at Romney Sands which I'm guessing is probably um, Ian Co looking at stuff there so we've got point detection, the two blue lights up in the Romney Sands loop. Uh, you've got the two signals either sides of Romney Sands, which are both saying red at the moment. Um, NHL is, a, I think, fairly unique to Romney. <coughs> All our level crossings have it, and the approach control has it. It's what we know as the nothing happening light. So basically, if the nothing happening light is on, so that's the two white lights that are on, on the approach control and Romney Sands crossing, the crossing has nothing going on, so there's no trains within its area or anything like that. The booms are where they should be. Everything's normal, and if a train turns up, it should work. If something happens or train strikes into the crossing, nothing happening light goes on. So if you were to turn up there um, in the local control unit, there's a nothing happening light. You can look at that and go, ah, there's something going on, or it thinks there's something going on. Um, so we find them quite useful. It's a, a nice confidence thing when you go away from a crossing that the light was on so you got a fair degree of confidence that it's actually going to work. Um, the two arrows at the top where it says approach control direction or something similar to that up and down, they turn green when there's a train approaching them and basically where it says TCM1 which is just below, below M2, that makes sense, sounds like algebra at school. Um, and TCM5 at the other end of the Romney Sands group. Basically they're the two strike-in track circuits, the approach control, which only allows one train at a time into the station. Um, but if you had two trains arrive pretty much at the same time, mm. standing here, you wouldn't know which train had struck in first. So that will light up and tell you which train struck in first. Um, other stuff on there, um, it tells you when there's a train in the platform. Uh, die block has a number of fault outputs that can tell you if something's going wrong. So they're on there and token in, token out, etc. Um, that's not fully working yet, but we're getting there. The graphs on the side, on the bottom right, is what I was saying about earlier. We're monitoring the two comms channels for die block, and you can see, particularly on channel B, the lower one, there is some dropout on it. Mm. They're very, very short duration, less than a minute typically. But we are seeing dropout. But with that, that looks that's a three day period that we're looking at mm. there. Well, I'll go back a step. Um, Stephen Clark and some graduates did a project on designing a level crossing using PLCs. Um, and that actually did gain some traction to the extent that Unipart Rail built a demonstrator uh, for the Railtex exhibition. Once the exhibition was over, they gifted it to us very kindly. Um, it had some shortcomings, shall we say, because it was configured for the exhibition. Um, as a result, it did lots of things we didn't want it to, and one or two things that we wanted it to do, it didn't do. So it was made workable, I won't say it was perfect, but it was workable, um, and was installed at Eastbridge Road at Dimchurch. Um, we've since found it has a few foibles and that. And it's also what we've now considered to be non-standard. Um, so that is the new controller for Eastbridge Road. What we decided to do was that's built as a sort of cassette, if you like, is we'll get our local hi man down, lift the old control system out the top of the case by taking the roof off it, 
drop the new one in, bolt it up, wire it, test it, etc. Um, so hopefully it shouldn't take too long because that will all be tested in here before it leaves to go to the site. The white box hanging on it is what we use for testing so we can put all the inputs into it that we expect to see in the real world um, and make it do things. We also find it's quite fun that you sort of sit here and you think, I wonder what happened if you did that? So you go and press the buttons, make it do that and see what happens. Um, certainly when we did the first one, because we did uh, I can't remember now, seven crossings out towards Dungeness with this system, um, that was quite a useful thing, just literally playing with it and doing silly things that could never happen in reality, but shows you what can, what it can do, what it can deal with. So the three or four white boxes with the little displays on them, the three to the right um, with the plug couplers on the mid spec connectors. Basically, the left hand one of the three is what we term PLC one for the unoriginal reasons. Um, that deals with all the real world inputs, so track circuits, platform plungers, drivers plungers, local control units, all the, all the stuff in the outside world. And that one we regard as configurable to the location it's going to. The next one in, the bigger one, um, again PLC2 unimaginatively, that's the one that is basically the brain of the crossing and that's the one that's had all the bulk of the testing done on it and everything. So that's the one that controls the lights, the barriers, the yodel alarms, headlamps, etc, etc. Um, and that one's regarded as a set in stone, so we don't mess with the insides of that one. That stays as it was. Peter Woodbridge did the original testing on it, um, and that stays as it was, so it doesn't change at all. PLC3, the last one, that one um, basically provides some checking functions for when the crossing is going to open. So that PLC 2 and 3 have to agree that the crossing should open before it will actually open. And it also mops up various little functions um, such as changing the volume on the yodel alarms at 11 o'clock at night and turning them back up in the morning. Massively engineered, you know, nice uh, ball bearings and things in there. The only thing it doesn't have compared with the British machine, it doesn't have contacts for feet halfway up, which we got round by saying, well, about halfway up is actually what the what the RSPG used to say. Or what is it? Was it RSP2 now? The, uh, the guidance. So we uh, do it by time. It takes too long. Do you get a lot of barrier crashes? Um, not that many, actually. We've had one. We've had one with a lorry where the barrier was dislodged up the other end of the line. 
one down the Battery Road, which was also on a hydraulic barrier. Goes very quickly in mid stroke and then slows down at the end. Coming up, Mike, mind your right arm. Yep. And to hand operate them, you put a key in here oh, right. and turn it, which has a bowden cable to lift the brake. So it frees uh, the, the drive frame free wheel then, you can, and you can push them up or down, but they're pretty much balanced. So I held on with a, um, a sort of sacrificial circuit thing that fires off. Oh, the marble one. Yeah. yeah, it's like a coal inside, isn't it? Yes. And the only the only time that's been dislodged was uh, some old boy ran into it on a mobility scooter. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. Knocked himself cold. So he was sort of lying stretched out in the road over here and the barrier was lying stretched out in the road over there. Um, all rather hilarious. Blame the barrier, no doubt. Yeah, I'm sure he did, yes. Yes. As I say, one of the um, one of the lessons of the level crossing up road program is that road users aren't getting any smarter. Driver vigilance device um, and a the normal arrangement. I'll need to check exactly what what this one is here. But the normal arrangement is if you get a short rail and a long rail together. The short rail tells you that the long rail that follows should be ignored because it's the trains going the other direction. Yep. Um, if you have a long rail on its own, then obviously it works in both directions. And the way it works is that on a steam loco, if you notice where the driver sits, there's quite a deep footwell between the tender and the loco. And fore and after that footwell, there, there are two proximity switches, and they sit at just about rail height. So when they go over these, if they go over a long rail, both of them will be activated at once. If they go over a short rail, only one will be activated at a time. And if it sees that only one being activated at a time first, it says ignore what comes after. <coughs> Very short pulse you get from one of these little bits of sideways rail, which are knockout rails, are to say you're coming up to a set of points. Just hold your horses for about 20 seconds because mm. that will allow you to get over the point without picking up the closure rail mm. as a rail yeah, a, yeah. on the way. But it just holds the system up so that's o over. Here. Yes, oh, well over any set of points. Yeah, you see yeah, any yeah. set of points, they've got the little, the little short lockout rail before yeah. and after them. 